um, pretty heavily used at Yelp. Uh, and it's the general idea is for um, re reading and using configuration. So I guess um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the design of the library, the problem it tries to solve. Um, but before that, I kind of want to justify the, the reason I created it. So I might ask, why do you need a configuration library in Python? Isn't it just as easy as specifying some constants in a module and importing the module and going from there? And I think that works pretty well at a really, with a really small program. And as your program starts to grow, you probably have a lot of other um, requirements for your configuration that you know, this might not work as well for. Uh, you might want different configuration files for different environments. Uh, you might want to be able to reload your configuration and log running processes. Um, and you might want to override, um, you, know, you have multiple files and you kind of want to override one with the other depending on um, the environment it's in. So we kind of started um, years ago, <coughs> excuse me, with something like this. Um, and then we moved to storing uh, configuration in a file, a different file format. So uh, something that's not very common maybe in Python would be XML. It's fairly robust, there's a lot of stuff here that we don't really care about. Um, Yelp generally uses YAML files. So YAML is uh, similar to JSON, it's a superset of JSON. Um, yeah, basically you would read this using the JSON module and you'd get back a uh, dictionary or nested dictionaries. And that works, but there's still some kind of missing pieces. You, you have to deal with um, digging into these nested dictionaries, passing them around, um, worrying about types, you, you'll only really get strings or integers out of here or lists and a lot of the time you're going to want um, you know dates or, or some other type that isn't necessarily supported by the file format um, so I kind of had these requirements for a configuration library um, I want to be able to support a lot of different file formats um, not just necessarily YAML or XML but really anything um, I wanted to have some tools to work with. I didn't want to have to pass a bunch of nested dictionaries around and worry about which keys were present and which weren't. Uh, I wanted to be able to validate configuration and cast the types to uh, Python types. I wanted to be able to periodically reload. And really something I want for any library is the ability to be able to extend the library for any use cases that uh, the original library author may not have thought of. Uh, I guess the short version of the goal was to really just uh, be able to read configuration and make it available in a usable format. So I took a quick look for some existing options. Um, there were some libraries for reading different configuration formats uh, and then some like, kind of thin wrappers above that for working with them. Um, but nothing really went beyond exposing kind of a, a slightly friendlier interface over the configuration data. Um, so I started getting to work and writing what I thought um, would be a, a nice configuration library. Uh, so I guess the first step was to be able to actually read in configuration from a file format. I mentioned uh, I want to be able to support many different formats, so I knew at some point I needed a consistent representation of all of these different configurations in Python. Um, I want to be able to extend it if I have a, a new file format comes out. I want to be able to very easily write a new loader for it. Uh, and I also want to be able to very easily overwrite um, files. Um, so that kind of led to this trade-off where a lot of the time you get this configuration data in and it'd be in this nested format. Um, so if you read something from JSON or YAML, you know, you, you get this dictionary in. Um, and that, the disadvantage here is that it's, it's very hard to merge these, and it's also really hard to kind of think about if you get one of these in from an XML file and you want to merge it with something that comes in from an any file, uh, it's kind of hard to think about how exactly those would merge together. So I decided that the easiest approach was to really simplify the implementation, made it a little easier to reason about, was to just to flatten everything out. So using like dotted notation, everything gets um, flattened. Of course, the disadvantage here is you can't actually read a dictionary out of configuration anymore. Um, there's some ways to work around that, but I won't talk about those up front. Um, all right, so I mentioned this consistent representation of a configuration. This, these uh, config name spaces are kind of like buckets where you can dump all of the configuration. Um, pretty straightforward class, it composes a dictionary and uh, it exposes this one apply config data method that basically uh, you know, does some validation, checks for duplication, and um, just updates the configuration values. You'll notice I don't actually extend a dictionary. I, I chose to compose a dictionary instead. And I think that's, uh, it's a pattern I've tried to apply throughout the library of composition instead of inheritance. Uh, in this case, I think the, the, uh, the reason it's nice
dictionary, I'd have to worry about the entire interface of a dictionary, which is you know, 20 plus methods. And uh, I kind of want to have a lot more fine grained control over, over what, how people interact with this object. And I also don't want to have to worry about supporting the entire uh, dictionary interface. So um, by composing, I can choose to you know, implement a few of the dictionary like methods um, and not worry so much about the ones I don't care about. This, is this working at all? No. No, it's not, eh? <laughs> Is it maybe the speaker? Because that the, the mic looked like it was on. Hello? 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 Yeah. You can you barely hear? It's like if I blow in it, you can hear it, but if I talk, it's like that. Well, I can hear it. Yeah. Can you? Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Structure doesn't really take any data. We have to call this apply config data method. Um, so I created this build loaders um, using the builder pattern. So the, the idea is that it's, it's a function that takes another function. The interface of this function is it accepts any arguments and it just has to return a dictionary with configuration data. And this build loader will compose that function. It will call it, uh, flatten the data, and then apply the, that data, basically update uh, the dictionary within config namespace. And again, so this is the alternative to inheritance, is this composition. And I felt that this makes it a lot easier to extend the library. Um, so an example, these are kind of like the built-in loaders that come with static comp, um, you know, pretty standard uh, file formats for configuration. Um, so, oh right, I pass in a function and it creates this, this way of loading in uh, configuration data. Looking at the implementation for some of these, um, something like JSON is really straightforward. Open the file, you choose a JSON module to load it. It returns a dictionary, and that's all we have to do because the, the builder function handles all the other concerns. Um, same same idea with Python loader. Uh, any file loader uses the config parse uh, module I mentioned. It you know, parses the any format, and then I build up a dictionary and return it. Um, but we also want to be able to build our own loaders. So this is an example of using the request library to uh, make a get HTTP GET request to some some URL. Um, optionally provide some authentication, and then it calls the JSON method on the response object. So this will return us, uh, again, a dictionary returned from a web server, and by wrapping this up in the build loader, um, we have a custom configuration loader very easily in, in two lines of Python. Um, you'll also note that this build loader could be used as a decorator, but I've chosen to just uh, call it explicitly so I can test the underlying loader function without having to worry about um, all of the other stuff in the builder method. All right, so this is an example of kind of like pulling all of these loaders together. Uh, you probably wouldn't do this in a real application, but just to kind of show how you can use them all together. Um, you might have like a system configuration file that's in any format. Um, so you load that initially as a set of defaults. Then maybe you want to support um, user defaults. So you might have this uh, YAML file in the user's uh, home directory, which then overwrites the system defaults. Um, then you want to pull some things in from maybe the environment. So you know we iterate over os.environ, find the keys that uh, apply to our application, then stuff those as further overrides. And then finally, um, using uh, an opt parser, this is kind of a, a pattern that the JVM uses where you, can, you have a single uh, option and you can provide key value pairs there to further override anything in your configuration. So you can see very easily you can, you can allow users to override uh, default configurations. All right, so uh, we've got a way of storing the configuration and loading it from files. Now we need an actual way to, to read the data um, instead of just kind of calling the get or get item method on the uh, con configuration namespace. Uh, my first approach was this was what I call like the getters interface. Uh, so the idea is I want to perform you know validation and caching to the specific type I wanted. If I was reading out a string from an XML file, I wanted to actually read some Python type. Um, I want to be able to cache fairly expensive uh, caching operations. And I also had this idea of um, being able to register expected keys. So if you've got a long running application and maybe you've got a module that only gets called you know, after two or three hours, you don't want to run through the whole application, get to that module and realize, oh, I missed some configuration value and the thing crashes and you have to repeat that. So the idea was using these getters, you could register all of your expected configuration up front. Uh, and that way, as soon as you've loaded it, you can call validate and then you won't have to go through 
you know, wait till the thing actually crashes, you'll know right away whether there's something's missing. Uh, we've kind of moved away from using these to read configurations, but I thought some of the Im implementation details here were kind of interesting, so I wanted to talk about it a little bit. So this is the, the interface, so you'd call get int or get some other type. Um, the, here the, the key is the configuration key, and then you provide a default value, uh, so just so we don't have to load any configuration. So we use this value in a few different ways, and we see that it, it looks like it's the value three. It looks like it's an integer type, but if we check the type of the value, it's actually this value proxy. Um, so this works in most cases. As soon as you try to check, like, is instance or is subclass or if you know C module will generally do those kind of checks, it kind of breaks down a little bit. But if you have fairly Pythonic code that uses duct typing, you can really use these proxy value objects as uh, any type. It, essentially, it acts as the type that it's wrapped around. So let's look at how that's uh, possible. So most of these operations in Python um, are done using these special methods. So you'd have one for any kind of comparison operation. You'd have it for um, you know addition for things like get item, getting the length of something are all implemented um, by creating one of these class, uh, methods on your class. Um, so what we have to do is we have to actually proxy those those method calls to the underlying value. Um, so the implementation of value proxies is kind of a stripped down version. Um, skipping over the new initially, we see it's got a constructor. It'll take this validator. It's just a function that casts the correct type. It'll take a config namespace option to pull the value out of. It takes a key to, to use to look into that namespace. And it takes a default value. You notice the default value is it's not actually none, as you might expect. It's this undef token. So if you want to actually pull out a none from your configuration, we need a way of differentiating a missing value from uh, a correct none value. So I created this, this special token so that if you're actually interested in pulling out none values, you can tell the difference between something that's missing and something that's uh, none or falsy. And then finally, we've got this uh, dynamic proxy value. Um, I've left out the implementation, but generally the idea is it just goes into that configuration namespace dictionary type object, uses the key that you've specified, and pulls out a value, passes it through the validator, and returns you um, the value that you've stored in the correct type. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. And then the magic comes in with this um, underscore underscore new. So what this allows us to do is it customizes the uh, creation of an instance of an object. So normally this would just call the init method of the class. Um, but in this case, we're building this custom class using build class step. And what this does is it iterates over all of the special, uh, special methods that we saw above and it creates the, the same method for each one of these. And that method looks uh, something like this method here. So the general idea is it just attempts to do an attribute lookup on the underlying value for the, the method you're trying to call, and then it calls that method with the uh, parameters passed in. So effectively, it's, pro uh, it's proxying every one of those special calls onto the wrapped up value. Uh, so wh why, why did I do all this magic? Uh, the, it, the idea was to, um, to do this registry I was talking about. So uh, yeah, it being able to, because you can create these um, value proxies at import time, um, they kind of act as uh, you know, a deferred evaluation of pulling a value out of your configuration. You kind of register that, OK, at some time later on, I'm going to attempt to pull this key out. And it happens at import time. So whenever you load the configuration, all of those values have already been registered, and you can validate uh, after you've loaded the configuration that two expectations meet up. Uh, so there are other ways of reading configuration, but before I get into that, let's talk a little bit about these validators that I, that I was mentioning. So it's a very simple interface, takes a single value, returns you uh, another single value that's in the type that you wanted, and it, every single one raises a, si a validation error. Uh, you know, you could say, oh, I'll just use like the int constructor to return me an int or something like that, but if you did that for all different types, you might have to handle four or five different exceptions, and we don't want to have to do that. We kind of want to only be able to catch one exception type instead of catching base exceptions. So this interface allows you to do that, uh, simplify error handling. And it also means that each caller doesn't have to cast the type after the config you're, you're pulling out the value you want. So these are uh, pretty straightforward. You know, call some function, catch the error, uh, raise a, a friendlier exception if something goes wrong. Same idea, you might want like a regular expression or a set and those type of things. Usually you can't actually have any configuration file format, so we're just casting things of the type we want. Uh, and again, going back to composition, so we've got all these scalar types, integers, dates, 
um, but we don't, might actually want lists of those. So there's another builder that takes any scalar validator and creates you um, effectively like a sequence validator. So you can have a list of ints, list of dates, whatever you want. Uh, and I also enumerate all of these so that, um, as I mentioned, you know, getters have, well, there's a getter for every single one of these and there's also other interfaces that have uh, a function for every single one of these. So instead of having to enumerate um, one of these for every single validator, by, by listing them in this dictionary, I'm able to just iterate over them and programmatically create all of these uh, functions without um, having to add uh, the associated method for each one. And of course, we want to be able to build our own custom validators. So this is kind of a, a random example. If we, want, if we had some kind of uh, maybe service configuration, we had a host port and timeout. Um, in our configuration file, it might be a list of three values, and we want to actually return it as a named tuple that has like a string and, and two integers. So we could create a validator like this and use it to make sure that um, the value that we're receiving out of our configuration is, is actually already the type that we want. All right, so that's validators. Um, so the, this reader interface is kind of like the alternative, one of the alternatives to the getter interface I mentioned before. Uh, I decided just backtrack, get rid of all the magic, don't do any caching, don't do any registration, just use the validator, return me a value. Similar interface, it's read int instead of get int. Again, there's one of these for every type, and now max iteration is an actual integer instead of a value proxy. Uh, it's a lot more straightforward. Um, we can also read them out of, uh, I, you know, I mentioned those configuration namespaces. You can have a bunch of those buckets. So uh, if you might kind of put a bunch of service configuration into one of those buckets, and you can specify a namespace to read it out. There's also this kind of convenience wrapper that you can create this object and call these read whatever method on the object instead of specifying the namespace every time. No, the, they all use, they still use the same validators. The difference is that it's not doing that value proxy magic where it's trying to uh, fake being another object. In this case, connection timeout is actually an integer. There's no uh, value proxy around it. And the benefit of, of this versus that is what? Uh, it's just a lot more obvious what's going on. If you call get int, you kind of expect to get an integer out of it when you're really getting this fancy thing that breaks as soon as you pass into a, a C module or whatnot. So, uh, yeah. That's the advantage. You can kind of read this out of your code a lot better. Cool. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of an example of how you build one of these up. You pass in the validator again, same kind of builder composition pattern. Uh, it wraps it up with whatever logic and then returns you a thing from, from the validator. Uh, so instead of having you know an actual definition for read in, read date, read rule, um, I just iterate over the validator and uh, yeah, put all these into a namespace. Okay, so in the third alternative, I try to the thing we lost with readers was this idea of registering expected values. So I wanted to get back to that, still be able to register expected values, but without any of the magic of the getters. Um, so this interface tried to do that, and it also brought along another kind of added benefit was the idea of grouping, uh, logically grouping related configuration together. So if you have uh, you have some class and it may have three, four different configuration values, it's nice to kind of group those together so you can see, okay, this is the configuration for this class. Uh, and it generally looks something like this. So if there's a meta class that allows you to turn these schema.float, schema.int, all these types into the actual uh, functions that you pull out of a configuration, uh, configuration namespace object, um, you specify the namespace you want to pull it from, and uh, a pre config path is kind of like the key prefix. Um, since our key names here are actually attributes, um, we can't actually use dots in them anymore, and we might end up using dashes, so you can actually uh, you see in this last example, actually specify the configuration key if it doesn't match the attribute. Um, the idea here is that very similar to like read int or get int, we, ne we now just have schema.int. Uh, and it's the same idea where it just pulls the value out of the configuration for you. Um, but it does it without any of like the, the fancy proxy magic. And because you specify these things at import time, they're, they're classes, so they run at import time, you, you get that uh, register of expected values back. Uh, there was a little bit of magic because there is a meta class. Uh, I realized recently that I could remove the meta class and use the uh, descriptor protocol in Python, which is how the uh, at properties are implemented, and I'd like to do that at some point so I could actually totally remove the, the meta class. Uh, and same kind of idea, there's a builder for it, so any kind of custom types you want to pull out of these, it's very easy to construct your own uh, base type. All right, so we've seen kind of um, loading configuration data, and we've seen how to read the data, but Another one of the requirements I wanted to, was to be able to actually reload uh, 
data without restarting the process. So um, long running processes, web, web applications, you know, you tend to run them for, for days without restarting them. You don't necessarily want to have to restart every time your configuration changes. So I wanted to create a way without having to restructure an application to be able to pull in these new configuration values. Um, you know, there's, there are definitely libraries out there that allow you to be very uh, strict about that, you know, using something like a KQ or iNotify or some, you know, kernel uh, support for actually like monitoring files and firing an event whenever a file changes. Um, but that kind of requires you to restructure your entire application around that event loop. And you don't necessarily want to do that all the time for just reloading configuration. So um, I went with another approach where you can, you can continue to use the same structure, but you may not have quite as solid a guarantee and you have to do a little bit of pull. Um, right, and the other reason to do that is that uh, reading configuration files can be expensive. Like the YAML um, parser isn't necessarily very fast, and if you've got a very large YAML file, you don't want to have to do that on every single web request, every single iteration. So you want to kind of detect when a, uh, a sig some kind of signal that a file has changed without having to actually do the whole reading of the file. Uh, so a common approach that we've used is checking modified time. Uh, you know, first of all, we just set a minimum interval so you're not even checking modified time every time you've got a very tight loop. You don't necessarily want to do that. Uh, then it, you know, check the modified time of all the files, compare them against the previous modified time, you know if it's changed. There's a, there's a pretty good chance that the contents of the file have changed. Uh, something uh, another developer contributed to the library was this um, inos check, which uh, it's great if you care about um, sub-second um, file modifications. Most file systems only have uh, second granularity, so if you actually want to reload this thing multiple times per second, then uh, yeah, you can do that, but obviously not nearly as portable. All right, so uh, that all gets wrapped up in this configuration watch object. Very uh, simple interface, just this one function reload has changed, and uh, it basically runs those checks, and if something has actually changed, it reloads uh, reloads the file and pushes it into the configuration namespace. Uh, you'd build it up with a config loader, which is really any callable at all in a list of file names to monitor. Um, one of the things I like about this is it's not tied at all to the rest of static comp. You could pass in um, any function to call in this config loader, and it just acts as like a general purpose, like watch per modified file modifications and run any of those. Is this something like every library or other? Uh, so on the next slide, this is kind of an example of how uh, so you would have some kind of iteration. If you were in like maybe a web application, you might call a uh, reload of changes on every web request. Uh, if you were in some batch processing, you'd have some kind of iteration. So kind of each step in the iteration, if you had a, a message queue, then every time it received a message, you might call reload of change to see if the configure has changed since their last message. And so that will go and uh, you know check the modified time, actually do the reload of this change, update all the configuration values. Uh, and it kind of allows you to keep your you know, your program structure intact and not make very many changes, really just add this one line and, and be able to benefit from updated configs without restarting. And um, that's it. I thought it was kind of interesting that, you know, despite configuration being a fairly straightforward, like, problem to solve, I was still able to kind of dig into some of the interesting parts of Python and, and mess with, uh, you know, things like meta classes and, uh, and uh, yeah, special attributes and things like that. Um, and if you're interested in knowing more, it's up on my GitHub. PyPy and the docs are on PyPy. And that's it. <laughs> Questions? Nope. So have you had, um, so this, through the Python data system, the same config files, are there just relatively different uh, ones that also contain the same config files? Or have very few configuration files that are also read from other languages. Okay. But um, I mean, something like YAML should have a parser in every language, so yeah. It's but just not as much validation. Right, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, how big are your configuration files? How big are the configuration files? Uh, there's definitely a few hundred megabytes worth of them. Yeah. What is on configuration? Configuration? <laughs> I mean, it's all split up, uh, you know, addresses to, to other services, uh, the database configuration itself is easily like 400 lines, I want to say, maybe, and that's just production, so we've got different versions for staging environments and things like that. Um, 
you know, we'll have a lot of constants, things like testing framework, or not, like AV testing frameworks, things you'd actually run in production, those all have configuration that would live in like a YAML file. Uh, yeah, th I think those are like the larger ones and then like specific features will have small amounts of configuration like that. Do you have a question as well? Yeah. At some point in the future, I might totally deprecate the get and the read and just use the schema version of things because I feel like that's kind of like the, the best of the three implementations. Um, but it was just kind of like, I personally, I wanted the get uh, interface because that made the most sense to me. But then as other people started using it, I kind of realized that it didn't necessarily make sense for everyone else to use um, just because it's kind of magical and you're not. I think one way to improve it might actually be to rename it instead of get int, like be like get proxy of int or something like that, so it's a lot more obvious you're not getting an integer if you're, you're getting something. 